you know, we're constantly marketed these superfoods. Whenever I see a superfood, I basically just mentally throw it in the trash bin. <laughs> um, what, usually when there's a, a health claim on the, on the uh, package, you can be pretty sure it's not healthy. And uh, real foods for longevity tend to be peasant foods, the cheap stuff everybody can afford. You know, in America, we hear all the time, you need fresh fruits and vegetables. That's the wrong way to start, especially in the inner city when there are poor people, for two reasons. One, people can't afford it, and it creates an immediate barrier. And number two, people don't know what to do with it. But you give African Americans or uh, Latin Americans or you know the Italians beans and a grain, they know exactly what to do with it. Africans, the beans and rice. Uh, the uh, Latin Americans, beans and corn tortilla. Um, the the um, the Italians, pasta fagioli, you know, pasta and, and beans. And, and you have a, a, a complex carbohydrates, fiber. You have all the amino acids necessary for human sustenance. So, so the big common denominator is peasants' food made to taste delicious. And that last part, uh, that's the most important ingredient. Taste is the most important ingredient. And these blue zones, they know how to make this it's very simple food, absolutely sing. Plus a bit of diversity, I think, as well. I mean, <clears throat> when I've gone to visit Japan and Italy and uh, Mediterranean countries, you do see some similarities, actually. I mean, <clears throat> you know, their noodles are the kind of spaghetti, but it's it's what else they put on the noodles. It's, it's the fact that they have all these different specialty restaurants in Japan that will, you know, use all kinds of different ingredients and, you know, hundreds of different kinds of mushrooms and onions and, and all these beans and bean sprouts and all these little pickles and fermented foods and the equivalent, you know, so people think of it, of Japan as just sushi and rice. It's not. When you actually go there, it's very, very different to the sort of the westernized version of what Japanese food is. And it, it varies a lot between the islands and uh, regions, just like it does in Italy. And so I think it's, I, for me, it's that diversity of the foods the fact that um, there's great food culture, so people will make all this stuff in their homes that may have had peasant origins, but is still carrying on, and they'll mix stuff together in rich soups and uh, casseroles all the time. And they're having fermented foods as well. I think that's the other thing that we don't really discuss enough is that, you know, in the Mediterranean countries, lots of goat's cheese and yogurts and other dairy ferments. And in Japan, of course, you've got all the misos and the fermented soy products that are eaten regularly. So you've got this diversity and the fermented foods and this food culture that is all about you know, passing on what your grandmother taught you to the next generation. I think they're also very binding things that that identify these these very healthy groups. What does the latest science tell us about about those those foods? And well, tell us that Dan's exactly right. Those foods are good. One, Dan. That's good. <laughs> <clears throat> and and up to recently, we didn't know why they were good. Really, we sort of because we've had this rather reductionist view of foods that you know reductionist uh, meaning meaning that we take the hundreds of chemicals in any one food and we talk about one of them. So. It might be carotene in carrots, or it might be vitamin C in a lemon. And we ignore all the 800 others there. And this is where we've, we've thought about what you know what's good about beans, and we just thought about one thing in beans. Uh, it turns out it's the entirety, it's that diversity, not only of the food, but the chemicals within each food and the different fibers that might be there. And there's a lot of fiber in the foods that Dan yes. was talking about? Is so, that the thing exactly. that really so, carries them together? Yeah, it's really a combination of uh, high fiber foods, which feed our microbes, but also polyphenols, which are these chemicals within them that used to be called antioxidants that are also fuel for our gut microbes. And these polyphenols have lots of properties on their own uh, as, as health-giving properties, I think the main action is by improving our gut health. And that's how we get all these universal effects. And I, I'd imagine my research on aging really is sort of pointed to the immune system being pretty critical here. Because if you can have a healthy immune system, then uh, 
that immune system is is repairing your body continuously. It's it's fighting early cancer. It's repairing the cells. It's uh, making sure that you you do live to an old age by picking up problems early. And if that's in perfect condition and it's not fighting inflammation, it's not trying to do not dealing with obesity. It's you know it's really focused on its main job. That is how most of us uh, who do succeed to live a long time are going to do it. So foods that are good for your gut are going to be good for your immune system and everything we've talked about. It's whole foods and it's not they're not poisoning their system with ultra-processed foods as well. And I think it's interesting, Dan was telling me that some of these places have lost their veneer um, that they had because... Meaning? That the... Um, Places like uh, Okinawa um, have now been exposed to ultra-processed food, and they're they're not doing as well so as their diet has changed. Gina, is that what you're saying, Dan? So their, their diet has gone moved from this sort of hundred percent whole food diets to increasing percentage of ultra-processed foods with chemicals and lower fiber intake, and starting to see an effect on this. And just to make sure that um, that that I'd understood understood this um, right, I think. What you're saying is if you look across the sort of set of foods that Dan was talking about, what you really see is foods that not only have all these polyphenols, which are all of these sort of magic complex chemicals, but they have a lot of fiber. And that critically what you're saying is fiber isn't one thing, which I think is how I always thought about it. And I suspect most listeners think about it, right? You see it on the back of the packet and it says fiber. Actually, I think you're saying there's like a thousand different sorts of fiber and that we think that the individual bacteria in our gut actually eat specific fibers so it's almost like yeah and, and that is that right they're very picky yeah they're very specialized and very picky so that's why the diversity of foods you know whether it's even different beans different colored beans is going to produce a different set of gut microbes inside you that are going to produce different chemicals that might enhance your immune system even more and help you live longer but i will say uh just a couple of refinements on what on what you've said about the blue zones um the blue zones are actually subsets of the countries we're talking about. Like Sardinia, the blue zone in Sardinia is very different than Italy. The blue zone in Sardinia uh, is actually only six villages, and they're descendant from a Bronze Age culture. They're matriarchal, like the rest of the Mediterranean's patriarchal, and they have a, a quite different diet. Same thing with Okinawa. Until 1917, Okinawa wasn't even part of Japan. It was called the Rukus Kingdom. And their diet is completely different. We tend to think of Japanese as fish heavy, but the Okinawans didn't eat very much fish at all. Uh, they tended to eat, there's emo, as I mentioned, tons of tofu, and basically what grew in their garden. And um, both of these blue zones did not have huge access to a, or a tradition where there was a vast variety of food. They were poor and they tended to have to eat what was available, what was growing that season. Of course, there were there were herbs and there were spices. You know, often they had a kitchen garden. Um, but if, if you look at the patterns, typically they only had 20 or 30 rest, uh, ingredients at any given time that sort of rolled with the season. So as you went from summer garden to winter garden, those ingredients. But I mean, I think it makes it, actually less discouraging for people because you don't have to think about having a hundred ingredients. Um, these people stayed very healthy for a long time. And Dan, I was just you. thinking like people are quite familiar with uh, Italian food. There'll be a lot more people who say, I don't really know Japanese at all. Could you, could you elaborate a little bit, I guess, on the difference between what these people in this vi these five villages in Sardinia are eating versus maybe sort of our traditional idea of what Italian y yes. food is? Because I think most of us are like, Oh, I eat nothing but Italian food, pizza and pasta. So is that if that's a secret to my long and healthy life, I'm, I'm feeling really good about it. Yeah, so, so the diet of longevity in Sardinia is more a verb than a noun because there were at least three phases. Okay. Until about 1960, believe it or not, most of what they ate was bread and cheese. These shepherds had several different kinds of bread, sourdough usually, but also a flatbed called carta de musica. Uh, they were shepherds, so these men would go into their into their pastures. And olive oil, they wouldn't they? Was... Olive oil, but not as much as you think. They're, the the highlands of uh, Sardinia, um, the the terrain is very rugged and not and not uh, conducive to the olive groves like you would see. Uh, actually more mastic oil, believe it or not, in the 40s and 50s. But to your point, olive oil is now ubiquitous. 
uh, in Sardinia. In about 1960s, Rhodes came in. And remember, centenarians were alive. They were middle aged in 1960s. Amazing. Their diet shift. Um, they were still poor people and they relied very heavily on huge gardens. And um, pasta started to come in, but there's more gnocchi than there is pasta. A lot of dishes made with fava beans. And um, um, the, of course, their celebratory food was, was pork. Never beef, very little chicken. But on average, uh, about five times a month, they would eat pork. The family pig. Five pork. times a month. So this yeah, is a very, very low level of meat eating you're describing. Very low level. The average and I American, guess if they're in the mountains, they're not eating a lot of fish either? No. In fact, you can see the ocean from the blue zone of Sardinia. But I met several centenarians that first time they ate fish in their life when they're in their 20s. Okay. Uh, and that's because it took a day to get to the sea. They didn't have a fishing culture, but maybe they'd get some fish. But by the time they got it back up to their village, it stunk. <laughs> you know, so you'd see this sort of dried cod once in a while, bacalao, they called it. And they you know, reconstitute that. But it wasn't you know, we tend to think fish is associated with longevity, but not a lot of fish in the blue zones.